biological information, self-organization. We've been talking about the book Biological Information, New Perspectives, edited by a number of people, most of whom are intelligent design advocates, and one of whom, Bruce Gordon, is a self-organization advocate, and he is in charge of the, the section that we'll be discussing today. Um, the uh, book is published by World Scientific Publishing Company, and it was published in 2013. That was a delay from 2011 when the papers were actually presented in, at Cornell University. Um, the book is available on the web, and if, you're, if you look at this in, on the video, you can freeze the frame and actually take it down unless you want to Google it instead. Um, the book is available in hardcover. It's expensive. Uh, it's over $100. Well, what do you expect when you can get the content for free? And uh, so they're not going to sell that many copies. Um, I bought a copy because I felt like donating to the company who had the courage to do this after another company backed out. Um, the uh, book is divided into several sections, general introduction, information theory and biology, biological information and genetic theory, theoretical molecular biology, and biological information and self-organizational complexity theory. And that, of course, is the section that we'll be talking about today. Um, the full title is Biological Information and self Organizational Complexity Theory Introductory Comments by Bruce Gordon, who's the section chairman, and then two papers, Evolution Beyond Entailing Law, The Roles of Embodied Information and Self-Organization by Stuart Kaufman, who's at the University of Vermont, and then Towards a General Biology, Emergence of Life and Information from the Perspective of Complex System Dynamics, uh, which is by Bruce Weber from Cal State Fullerton and Bennington College. And that note we'll discuss later. Um, to go back to the introductory comments, and I think they're worth paying attention to, no discussion of new perspectives on biological information would be complete without consideration of the anti-reductionist approach of the self-organizational school of thought. The reductionist approach focuses on systematically taking apart complex systems and analyzing their individual components, seeking to explain the behavior of the whole in terms of its parts. This strategy has been very fruitful, and such research undoubtedly will continue, but like the intelligent design scientists and researchers exemplified by the editors and other contributors to this volume, self-organizational theorists believe that new theoretical approaches are necessary to understand, I'm sorry, to understand the hierarchically integrated information networks that undergird morphogenesis in development bi developmental biology and evolution. How do systems of genes and proteins integrate into holistic information structures? How do dynamic organelle structures form in cells? What controls cell growth, division, and differentiation in organisms? How is genomic information regulated in the construction of an organism? How do selective environmental pressures integrate through time with organismal development to affect the evolution of species? How do integrated ecosystems form and evolve? Both self-organizational theorists and intelligent design theorists believe that natural selection operating on random genetic mutations is an insufficient basis on which to explain the origins of biological complexity and irrelevant to the origin of life. ID theorists also believe that the self-organizational capacities of physical sy systems are limited, falling far short of the order we observe, so the ultimate source of information for the origin of life and hierarchically integrated morphogenesis in both organismal development and speciation must be in extrinsic to biological systems and their physical environments. There must be a designer or designers. In contrast, self-organizational researchers argue that global pattern development, including the highly complex hierarchical information structures characteristic of life, 
can emerge solely from the interactions of lower level components and part whole dynamics without ultimate or proximate goal directed input. Whether biological information is somehow self originating is thus a central point of disagreement between intelligent design theorists and self organizational complexity theorists. Skipping again, I'm not reading the whole thing. The contributors to this discussion of biological information from the standpoint of complex system dynamics are well-known names among self-organizational theorists, Stuart Kaufman and Bruce Weber. Their involvement in this project traces back to a 2007 conference I organized in Boston under the auspices of the Discovery Units, uh, pardon me, the Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture. The conference commemorated the famous 1967 Wistar Symposium, or Mathematical Challenges to the Neo-Darwinian Interpretation of Evolution. Several of the ID scientists whose work is represented in this volume also participated in this Wistar, Wistar retrospective. The general perception among the participants in the Boston Symposium, as with the participants in the Cornell University Conference, is that the mathematical and biological challenges posed to the modern evolutionary synthesis, that is neo-Darwinism, have not been resolved, but actually have grown more acute as our knowledge has exploded. The ellipses in yellow are mine. Of course, ID theorists and self-organizational theorists diverge both individually and collectively in their heuristic strategies and in the models they propose, but they have things to learn from each other and it is this, in this spirit that Kaufman and Weber have contributed to this volume. And that's the end of the introduction, and we'll move on to Stuart Kaufman's essay. Uh, no, I'm sorry. That isn't the end. There's one more paragraph. And he talks about Stuart Kaufman's essay. And since we're going to talk about that anyway, we're going to skip that part, as well as Bruce Weber's uh, paper. Considered together, the uh, essays by Kaufman and v Weber provide both an excellent overview of the state of the art in self-organizational thinking and an extremely useful guide to the literature on the subject. It is to be hoped that self-organizational theorists and intelligent design theorists will continue to engage in a mutually beneficially, pardon me, in mutually beneficial and constructive dialogue as these new perspectives on biological information grow to maturity. So you have somebody who's saying we've, we can disagree, we can still learn from each other. And now we move into Kaufman, and I'm going to read the abstract in total because it gives you a good summary of what he'll be talking about. It is argued that no law entails the evolution of the biosphere. Biological evolution rests on both quantum random and classical non-random natural selection and whole part interactions that render the sample space of adjacent biological possibilities unknowable. This would seem to create an insurmountable problem for intelligent design in biology. Okay. Nonetheless, the evolution of ensembles of interacting systems can be modeled by statistical laws that have strong self-organizational properties. Uh, keep that summary in mind. Some compelling examples modeling evolutionary self-organization in biology are presented, and it is concluded that a new science of order and organization beyond entailing law is required. His introduction, I wish to make major claims in this article. Foremost, as presaged in the title, I claim that no law entails the evolution of the biosphere. Now, He's going to be self-critical here. We must be deeply careful of so large a claim, for if it is true, the reductionist dream of a final theory that will entail all that happens in the universe is false. So he disagrees with that. But this has been the dream since the Greeks, through Newton, Einstein, and Schrodinger, to, the, to most recently Steven Weinberg in his dreams of a final theory. If the claim is correct that no law entails the evolution of the biosphere, it will follow that we do not know the ever-changing phase space of the future evolution of the biosphere. F. Bailey and G. Longo make this point emphatically in their mathematics and the natural sciences, as do I in reinventing the sacred. From the fact that we do not know the ever-changing phase space 
of biological evolution, it will follow that we do not know the sample space of what I, of course, Kaufman call the adjacent possible of the evolution of the biosphere. From this it follows that standard notions of information theory, such as Shannon and Komogorov, cannot be applied, since both require pre-statement of the sample space of the process. For example, for Shannon, pre-statement of the set of possible messages, the sample space, is needed to compute the entropy of the information of the source. If we do not know the sample space of evolution, Shannon's starting point is moot. Moreover, if we do not know the sample space of the process of biological evolution, then probability calculations used, utilized by intelligent design scholars are also either moot or deeply suspect. That's an interesting way of destroying that particular argument. Um, these issues mean we need to invent a new concept of biological information. No adequate formulation now exists. Neo-Darwinism is bankrupt. I will propose the start only of such a formulation. If no law entails the evolution of the biosphere, then we must ask what forms of laws, if any, can we, we can have. One approach that I will discuss is the study of ensembles of systems. For example, the study of ensembles of mo model genetic regulatory networks controlling cell differentiation and ontogeny, what they're going to become. Ensembles of reaction networks capable of catalysis of the same reactions to form collectively autocatalytic cell sets for the origin of the molecular reproduction and life. And ensembles of tunably rugged fitness landscapes, landscapes that can change with time. Two major features of this ensemble approach are a search for statistical laws despite the absence of entailing laws. As more facts are learned about the systems in question, more refined ensembles can be built for better statistical laws. Remarkable evidence for profound self-organization has been found, for example, as typical or generic properties of ensembles of genetic regulatory net networks. The self-organization almost surely plays a role with selection in evolution. Skipping ahead, this article is organized as follows. In section one, I will discuss work with senior French-Italian mathematician Giuseppe Longo that is the strongest case we can currently make that no law entails the detailed evolution of life. Hence my conclusion that this spells the end of a physics worldview. In this discussion, I expand on my own work and that of F. Bailey and Longo, both of which claim the, and demonstrate that the phase space of evolving life persistently changes in ways we cannot say. In section two, I discuss the stunning fact that evolution without selection creates its own adjacent possible empty niches, which it may fill. Hence, evolution in a kind of natural magic, I love that word, builds the very possibilities it becomes. That is, I demonstrate the truly astonishing fact that without natural selection acting at all, the evolving biosphere creates the ever new adjacent possible empty ecological niches that evolution may or will fill. Thus, without any selection acting to present, pardon me, to create this astonishing aspect of evolution, evolution itself is building the very possibilities that evolution becomes. Here, the claim from Heraclitus that life bubbles forth seems right and deeply new. You're going to see that phrase over and over again. In section three, I lay out the claim that we do not know the sample space of the evolutionary process, so standard information theory is moot. In section four, I, Kaufman, of course, relate the above results briefly to the hopes of the intelligent design community to demonstrate irreducible complexity and its vast improbability by normal evolutionary processes. So apparently irreducible complexity is worth something. In section five, I describe three examples of the use of the ensemble approach to find statistical laws in the absence of entailing laws for the detailed becoming of the biosphere. I would discuss models of ensembles of genetic regulatory networks, the emergence of collectively autocatalytic sets, and the statistical features of evolving fitness landscapes. All also exhibit the self-organization alluded to above. Evolution is beyond entailing law, is section one. At the dawn of Western philosophy and science some 2,700 years ago, Her Heraclitus declared roughly that the world bubbles forth. 
there is in this fragment of thought and natural magic a creativity beyond the entailing laws of modern physics. I believe Heraclitus was right about the evolution of the biosphere in human life. We live beyond entailing law in a kind of a natural magic we co-create. So that was uh, a, not just passing reference, it was a theme earlier. Early sociologist Max Weber said that with Isaac Newton we became disenchanted and entered modernity. He was right. Uh, actually, more like Laplace, but anyway. Uh, before, uh, before Newton, our tradition from Genesis saw a creator God whose divine agency, rather like the ma natural magic of Heraclitus, created the world also beyond entailing law. Although Newton was a creationist, of course. Um, skipping over with Pierre Simon Laplace, this became the bedrock of reductionism. Given the possibilities and momentum of all the particles in the universe, a vast intelligence could, using Newton's laws, deduce the entire future and past of the universe. For Laplace, the complete uh, determinism of Newton's laws coexisted with a capacity for accurate prediction. With Poincaré in the three-body gravitational problem, deterministic chaos was discovered, basically shooting Laplace's idea in the foot. Thus, in modern classical physics, determinism does not imply predictability. He talks about the twin pillars of the 20th century physics, classical physics with general relativity and quantum mechanics. I think most people would say general relativity destroyed classical physics or at least modified it beyond recognition. But anyway, I believe we reach a terminus of this physics worldview at the watershed of life. As we will see, it seems Heraclitus was right. Life bubbles form in a kind of natural magic. A purpose of this article is to spell out this natural magic which exhibits itself as the evolving biosphere literally constructs without selection its own future possibilities. First, in truly, uh, cent uh, of truly central importance, evolution itself defies... Now, remember, when he says evolution, it is not synonymous with neo-Darwinism. He thinks neo-Darwinism is kaput, or at least is not complete. Evolution itself defies both the completeness of quantum mechanics and the completeness of classical mechanics, read relativity, yet unites them both. We know this, but never say it. Mutations are often quantum, random, and indeterminate events yielding Darwin's heritable variations. Yet evolution itself is not random, as the phenomenon of a convergent evolution demonstrates. That's, of course, assuming that evolution happened. Uh, for example, the eye has evolved independently 11 times. I've seen up to 42 claimed. Um, whatever. Um, and the convergence of the independently evolved vertebrate and octopus camera eye to a stunning near identity, the result of powerful natural selection, is obviously not random. More examples are found in the convergent evolutions of marsupials and mammals, for example, the marsupial wolf. Thus, in blunt terms, biological evolution is neither quantum indeterminate random nor deterministic cl classical mechanics. The living world is, really is new. And uh, moving along, one very important possibility is that after 85 years of unsuccessful attempts to unite quantum mechanics and general relativity, it may really not be possible to unify them into the single theory whose dream is that of Weinberg. We may have to live with quantum mechanics and classical physics ununited. In this case, evolution itself demonstrates that both nevertheless mix together quantum indeterminately at random mutations, united with non-random effects of natural selection acting at the level, at least in part of classical physics, and thus the camera eye evolved in octopus and invertebrates. That sounds a lot like accepting neo-Darwinism, doesn't it? Okay. But this requires something that it seems not to be entailed in current physics. Let a quantum indeterminate random DNA mutation occur, and then natural selection act to evolve toward the tuned camera eye. As this largely classical physics evolution occurs, different alleles of mutated genomes are selected in the evolving population. Thus, when quantum random and indeterminate mutations creating yet new alleles occur, the very possibilities of what those quantum 
event mutations might be, that is, in what gene sequence they may occur, has changed due to largely classical physics natural selection. In turn, the quantum random indeterminate mutations alter the, what natural selection will do. Taken together, evolution is both quantum indeterminate and also non-random. Again, shades of neo-Darwinism. Given this mixture of quantum indeterminate random and classical physics, non-random selection, it seems very hard on this basis alone to conceive of a single law that entails the detailed evolution of the biosphere. Moving along, second, biological evolution concerns Kantian wholes, where the whole exists for and by means of the parts, and the parts exist for and by means of the whole. An instance is a collectively autocatalytic set of peptides as produced by Gronin Ashkenazi of Ben-Gurion University in his nine peptide autocatalytic set. No peptide catalyzes its own formation from two fragments of itself, but instead catalyzes the formation of one or the other nine peptides from two fragments of that peptide. If this were Wells, there would be a reference. I'm sure there is a reference, but it's not given. Third, a living dividing cell is both a collectively autocatalytic set and thus a Kantian whole but of central importance it achieves attached closure in a much wider set of tasks than mere catalysis. That is, Gorin's is play com compared to the human cell. Fourth, and of deep importance is this, we cannot name all the causal consequences or uses of any object, say a screwdriver alone or with other objects. You could use it for a chisel, you could use it for a hammer, uh, but that means that we cannot know that we have ever listed all the uses of a screwdriver alone or with other objects or processes. Now consider an evolving cell in which one or more objects or processes, each with myriad causal consequences, finds a novel use that we cannot precede, but which enhances the fitness of the cell and so is grafted by natural selection into the evolving biosphere. This finding of a novel use that we cannot pre-state occurs all the time. The famous flagellar motor of some bacteria made use via Darwinian pre-adaptations or ex-adaptations, discussed further below, of fragments of its flagellar proteins that were serving entirely different functions in other bacteria. Of course, going unmentioned now is the fact that some of those proteins didn't form any other function that we know of. Um, well, what about them? Fifth, Darwinian pre-adaptations are typically not pre-statable. Pre-adaptations occur all the time in evolution. He talks about fish and swim bladders. Paleontologists believe that f swim bladders evolved from the lungs of lungfish. I thought it was the other way around, that the lungs of the lungfish evolved from swim bladders, but whatever. Do you think it could pre-state all the possible Darwinian pre-adaptations just for humans in the next million years? We all say no. But this means something terribly important. We do not know the sample space of the evolution of the biosphere by Darwinian pre-adaptations. But the fact that we do not know the sample space means that we cannot make normal probability statements. Sixth, mathematics requires that we have the concepts beforehand of the relevant variables, say mass and length of a pendulum for the law of the pendulum. But unlike physics, where the phase spaces are always pre-stated, in evolution, the phase space is always changing, and as we shall see even more stunningly, building without selection the very possible ways it may change its phase uh, space. We cannot write down the laws of motion for the evolving biosphere. Again, moving along seventh, we do not know ahead of time the emerging novel adjacent possible empty niches, such as the fish swim bladder into which some worm or bacteria could evolve to live. And again, moving along the actual title, Life Bubbles Forth. Heraclitus was right, Life Bubbles Forth, Beyond Entailing Law. And I'm going to be kind of moving very rapidly now. By a kind of natural magic, the biosphere creates its own future. More, if Max Weber is right, that Newton, with Newton we became disenchanted and er, entered modernity, my hope is that the natural magic of life bubbling forth and a fortiori human life can re-enchant us. Perhaps we can move beyond modernity. Sounds to me like he wants to move back, in which case I wouldn't totally argue about that. Three, beyond standard information theory to embodied information. 
I begin with Stanin, Shannon's famous information theory. Shannon chose on purpose to ignore any semantics and to concentrate on purely syntactic symbol strings. And of course, that's a point that intelligent design advocates make all the time. And we're going to just move very rapidly because we want to get through all of this uh, in one stand and also because it's not that remarkable what we're skipping over. In summary, standard information theory, both purely syntactic and requiring a presaged sample space, is largely useless with respect to evolution. A start of such a theory is taken in Kaufman, and he cites his own work, of course. And uh, then implications for intelligent design. The underlying concept of intelligent design, ID, is perfectly sensible, but perhaps in a restricted set of scientific context, SETI has this, this legitimate problem. So he concedes that we do use intelligent design in SETI. Intelligent design seeks to accomplish the analog of SETI. But if, as above, we can construct no probability measure for the emergence and evolution into the ever-changing adjacent possible of the evolving biosphere, it would seem that such calculations are either moot or questionable at present. So the reason he doesn't accept it is because there's so many possibilities that we can't do the the math. Um, then there's several sections that I'm just going to list. The ensemble approach to the statistical laws and self-organization with no entailing law. The ensemble approach to genetic regulatory networks. The ensemble approach can yield statistical laws beyond entailing laws. The ensemble approach to the emergence of collectively autocatalytic sexes, a generic phase transition in complex chemical reaction networks. Several paragraphs on that. The ensemble approach to emergence of collectively autocatalytic sets as a generic phase transition in complex chemical reaction networks. Several paragraphs on that. And then finally, the conclusion. I have offered rather radical views. Most notably, it may well be true that there is no law which entails the evolution of the biosphere. If so, what I speak of is, in fact, the end of a physics worldview of the dream of reductionism to find a fundamental final theory that entails all that occurs in the universe. And uh, that's the end of his paper. We'll move on to that of uh, Weber. Uh, he's probably English, and so it's probably Weber by now. I argue that Darwinism is best described as a, ring, as a research tradition in which specific theories of how natural selection acts to produce common descent and evolutionary change are instantiated by specific dynamical assumptions. The current Darwinian research program is the genetical theory of natural selection or the modern evolutionary synthesis. Pre presently, however, there is ferment in the Darwinian research tradition as new knowledge from molecular and developmental biology together with the deployment of complex system dynamics, suggests that an expanded and extended evolutionary synthesis is possible. I think it's that also that the old theory isn't possible, or at least isn't persuasive. One that could be particularly robust in explaining the emergency, emergence of evolutionary novelties and even of life itself. Critics of Darwinism need to address such theoretical advances and not just respond to earlier version of the research tradition. So he's taking a little bit of a shot at ID. You're shooting at the wrong guy. Towards a general biology, uh, that was the abstract. This is towards a general biology, emergence of life and information from the perspective of complex system dynamics. That's the title we read before. And I wanted to give you a little hint as to what He's talking about, he talked about the Wistar Institute in 1966, which we read from the introduction, and the 2007 conference in Boston organized by Bruce Gordon under the auspices of the Center for Science and Culture at Discovery Institute. So there's, even though these people have differing viewpoints, they've been working together um, and partly off of each other for some time, and this is an acknowledgment of that fact. My thesis is, that the Darwinian research tradition defined below is being enriched, extended, and expanded by new information and concepts, and that a Darwinian evolutionary synthesis deploying background assumptions of complex system dynamics can robustly guide further research into biological phenomena and lead to the development of a theory of general biology. 
So if we expand evolution a little bit, maybe we can make it. Such a general theory could and should address issues of the emergence of life as well as the evolution of life uh, from creature to creature. Topics properly previously screened off in the Darwinian discourse. Properly previously screened off? Okay, well, he's going to tackle that. After reviewing the history of neo-Darwinism and the modern evolutionary synthesis in the Darwinian research tradition, and making the case for shifting background dynamical assumptions to those complex systems, I will focus specifically on the current status of origin of life research and how such work may contribute to a theory of general biology. Finally, I will argue that intelligent design theory does not provide a suitable scientific alternative and that it does not provide a conceptual framework for empirical and theoretical research on the phenomena of emergent complexity. However, criticism from other intelligent design theorists, among others, uh, pardon me, uh, from intelligent design theorists, among others, of ongoing efforts to develop a new Darwinian evolutionary synthesis can help sharpen the deployment of such a research program. They may be wrong, but their criticism may have some merit and we should listen to them. The modern evolutionary synthesis and the Darwinian research tradition. In Darwinism, evolving and subsequent publications, David DePew and I, so he's worked on this before, have argued that there is not a single Darwinian synonymous Darwinism synonymous with evolutionary theory, nor is the modern evolutionary synthesis, often called neo-Darwinism, but see footnote two, a monolithic research program. Rather, we see a Darwinian research tradition. They're all over the place. After all, Darwinism was not the only research tradition that addressed the phenomenon of evolutionary biology. A Lamarckian, Jefferian, or Spencerian conceptual framework and research program in which internal factors, developmental processes, or natural laws of complex complexification, respectively, were taken as a driving force of evolution. Such scientists called themselves Darwinians, which was for some just a label for accepting dissent with modification. Moving along towards a general expanded Darwinian synthesis and a general biology. Stuart Kaufman applied, that's the same Stuart Ta Kaufman that wrote the previous article, applied concepts of nonlinear dynamics and self-organization to both the developmental genetic systems and to the problem of the origin of life, to the latter of which he also brought in non-equilibrium thermodynamic considerations as well as consideration of the emergence of agency. I will return to the issue of origin of life, of the origin of life below. Jabonska, Jabonska and Lamb argued that since in later editions of On the Origin of Species, Darwin's hypothetical mechanism of inheritance had a Lamarckian character, their inclusion of epigenetic factors could be considered as a recovery of Darwin's original vision. A recent review of developmental genetics and epigenetics by Robert Reed argues for an evolutionary theory that is in, its own ter in his own terms outside the Darwinian tradition, but more at home in a Lamarckian or Jeffreyan one. That is, the internal factors or developmental processes drove the, uh, uh, drove the evolution of life. Skipping over cautionary considerations and a perspective on emergence. As a commitment to methodological naturalism does not logically entail a commitment to philosophic militarism, so we should not take any version of Darwinism as being a synonym or a placeholder for philosophical materialism unless such a move is self-avowed or can be demonstrated, as in the case of writers such as Dawkins or Dennett. He hints that he himself may not be a philosophical, uh, philosophical materialist. In what follows, I am going to examine current research on emergence theory, as well as current work on emergence of life. Even though this issue of the origin of life historically lies outside the orbit of Darwinian research tradition, I will take the cue from Wiccan as well as Kaufman and Terence Deacon that the processes and phenomena are rightfully the object of a general biology and can and should be incorporated in any expanded version or new synthesis of Darwinism. Emergence of emergence's paradigm. A uh, little self-reference there. The latter part of the 20th century saw the rise of a new way of understanding nature and employing complex system dynamics to explore and explain phenomena of self-organization and emergence. I define emergence as the appearance of novel properties, structures, 
and or patterns in a system that are not present in the constituent components or easily predicted weak form or explained, and he'll say later that he's using the strong form, from the laws of and processes affecting the constituents of the system. It is the strong form of emergence that will be of concern here, especially with regard to the emergence of life. In strong emergence, the emergent phenomena are novel in that they have properties not contained in the components and are re irreducible in the sense that the emergent phenomena are not identical to their composition. Emergent systems exhibit a kind of holism in that the emergent phenomena cannot be analyzed into their parts without losing sight of their essential character. So this could be called a Kantian whole, I guess. Further, in strong emergence, the emergent phenomena obey laws that rely at least par in part on their novel properties. That is, some of the processes and laws themselves are emergent, even as the processes of their emergence itself operates under general natural laws, including, for example, a putative fourth of thermodynamics. I assume that's fourth law of thermodynamics, in addition to other natural laws. We'll get a hint as to what that might be later. Finally, in strong emergence of the emergent phenomena, pardon me, in strong emergent, the emergent phenomena can, be, can impose conditions on their constituents that depend on the nature of the identity of the emergent phenomena. That is, such systems can exhibit downward causation. The organism decides to do something and it happens, whereas at top up is everything happens because of the molecules. The formation of Bernard convection cells and is, is an example of self-organizing process in which the macroscopic structures of the convection flow allow for more efficient dissipation of the energy gradient given a thermodynamic reward for the production of, the st of structure. The process of formation of such convection cells involves a type of selection process working with self-organization. Rod Swenson has shown that the initial formation of convection cells produces macroscopic structures of varying si various sizes and shapes, but that the system quickly settles down into a pattern of hexagonal cells of uniform size. And here's an example uh, that's given in Wikipedia, so it's free and nobody can complain about it. Um, and here's another example that's from NASA and it's from the government, so nobody can complain about it. And you can see here very nicely hexagonal cells. Uh, this is created by heating, uh, say, oil, in this particular case with the little aluminum particles that trace where they're going. And this is a time exposure, and you can see that the convection comes up in the center and then goes down on the sides. That's Bernard cells. Thus, even before there is biological selection for the reproductively fit, emerging with the emergence of life, there exists in, in nature interplay of self-organization and selection at the level of physical and chemical phenomena. Is the origin of life a Darwinian problem? Darwinism himself carefully avoided the issue of the origin of life since he was concerned with explaining how living beings and their lineages changed over time and how novelties could arise through the action of natural selection upon heritable variation. For example, quoting The Origin of Species, how a nerve becomes sensitive to light hardly concerns us more than how life itself originated, was consistent with his accepting that life was breathed into a few forms or into one, which is the tail end of The Origin of Species. This position served to distinguish Darwin's theory of evolution from Lamarck's in which active matter spontaneously and continuously generated life. Privately, Darwin was willing to speculate about the origin of life, as he did in a letter to Joseph Hooker in 1871. But if, and oh, what a big if, we could conceive in some warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, light, heat, electricity, and etc. being present, that a protein compound was chemically formed, ready to undergo still more complex changes. Herbert Spencer argued that biological evolution is a part of a general cosmic process of the universe becoming less homogeneous and more complex, in which the origin of life was a specific instance. That's, of course, Spencerian evolution. However, J.B.S. Haldane, Alexander Operin, and J.D. Bernal, Marxists all, therefore materialists, of course, argued that advances in biochemistry and geochemistry meant that serious scientific study of the origin of life is possible, even if not required, 
by the theories of the Darwinian research tradition. And of course it is required by their own tradition. They did recognize that from their commitment to philosophical materialism, it was necessary that the origin of life be the result of natural processes only. So if you're a Darwinist, you can fudge. If you're a materialist, you can't. Current perspectives on the emergence of life from uh, Weber's perspective. Whether a reductionist or emergentist approach is taken to the origin of life, the possible reactions and routes to the organized complex complexity of living matter is constrained by the properties of matter and the laws of chemistry and physics. Moving on, the minimal elements that need to be considered in any account of the emergence of life are an energy source and a mechanism to capture energy such that the entropy of the system decreases even as the entropy of the system plus environment increases. So you need a machine. Uh, who makes machines? Well, do they spontaneously arise? Abiotically produced component molecules subsequently produced by autocatalytic networks in protocells and later in cellular metabolism. Autocatalytic sets of cat uh, catalysts, polypeptides, polynucleotides. Closure in both the sense of physical closure and an osmotic barrier that separates the system from everything else and chemical or catalytic closure. Some means of reproduction and variation at the level of autocatalytic sets and thermodynamic cycles and templates for re replication and coding for catalysts. Those are things uh, required. It is an open question as to which of these steps must be prior to others or if some other ensemble of factors is needed before the transition to life could occur. In an emergentist approach, it would be expected that several steps could arise concurrently and act synergistically to give rise to more complex structures and phenomena among which would be included natural selection. So it sounds like he's saying it happened all at the same time, in which case the probabilities, of course, go down. Stanley Miller, working in the laboratory of Harold Urey, demonstrated that a number of amino acids could be produced by chem via chemical processes that might have occurred in the primitive Earth. Although the atmosphere globally might not have been as re reducing as Miller assumed, oops, um, mainly due to the escape of hydrogen gas, there would be local regions that were, such as near volcanoes or deep ocean hydrothermal vents. So if you're going to model this on the basis of an entire Earth producing RNA or whatever, you're probably not being fair. It would have happened only under very localized conditions, which of course decreases the chances of it happening. Alternative pathways to amino acids are plausible from carbon dioxide and from hydrogen cyanide. Yeah, hydrogen cyanide is the primary product of all of these reactions. Um, further, the presence of amino acids in the interior of meteorites indicate that they can be produced elsewhere in the universe by natural processes. Indeed, extraterrestrial sources of organic compounds might have been up to three orders of magnitude greater than terrestrial ones for the primitive Earth. What I find fascinating is there's no notation of how, what the absolute value of any of those is. It happens to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to the minus 7th molar, so it's not, uh, you couldn't live on primordial soup. How well has the dominant theory near neo-Darwinism met this challenge? The structure of metabolism itself suggests that this should be assessed in a hierarchical way. At the lower level, the question is how well the theory explains the origin of new functions for single enzymes, while at the higher level, it is how well it explains the origin of more complex metabolic functions that emerge when enzyme functions are combined with, to form metabolic pathways and the integrated networks of pathways that constitute metabolism as a whole. Polypeptides and proteins produced abiotically would initially have a random sequence, but such sequences have a high probability, at least 25%, of assuming a compact globular tertiary structure and can exhibit some weak catalytic activity. No numbers given on that, final, that second thing. And uh, <laughs> uh, that seems, uh, if you take the work of Doug Axe and, uh, and Gager, to be uh, a bit of an overestimate, shall we say. Thus, a highly specified informational content is not necessary for a polypeptide to serve as a catalyst, because if it is, they're hung. The hard problem in origin of life 
research is not so much how the monomers and even polymers might have risen by physical and chemical processes, although that's a plenty hard problem itself, but rather how it came to be that a digital type code in nucleic acid came to specify the analogical information in the thousands of proteins that catalyze metabolism and are involved in signally and information processing. I think signally is used as a, a noun there. It is here that the new sciences of complexity can have their greatest impact. So, unfortunately, I'm not sure that it tells you how that works. That's an unsolved problem at, at present from their point of view. The complex systems of view of the emergence of life. As Kaufman has analyzed in his simulations, protein sequence space can cover what he terms catalytic task space of all possible chemical reactions that can be catalyzed by polypeptides. Thus, even an ensemble of random peptides would be able to provide such coverage. Wow, the optimism. Um, Kaufman, who suspects that such an emergence of organization and complexity, an emergence of life, would be expected, an expected consequence of natural law, possibly a fourth law of thermodynamics, writes, and this is the closest I get to the fourth law of thermodynamics, I think it is that life bubbles forth, but we can think of the origin of life as an expected emergent collective property of a modestly complex mixture of catalytic polymers. Life bubbles forth. I guess it, it, it happened. Not only does uh, Kaufman see an innate holism during the emergence of life, but he concludes that the routes to life are broader than imagined. Well, certainly uh, the imaginations of uh, People like Kunin have a very narrow uh, way of getting to life. David Diemer has shown that amphiphilic molecules, those with a hydrophobic or water-hating end and a hydrophilic or water-loving end, though not lipids per se, can be extracted from carbonation chondri carbonaceous chondrites, meteors containing carbon compounds, and that these molecules spontaneously form bilayered vesicles very much like soap. When vesicles of amphiphiles derived from a meteorite are supplemented with polycyclic hydrocarbons also extracted from meteorites, have light sh shined, I'm sure that's supposed to be, upon them, they pump protein, protons across the membrane. Yeah, there's a reference, apparently you can do this. Of course, that's assuming that, uh, that the Polycyclic hydrocarbons are mostly inside those vesicles rather than outside. Implications of an emerging emergence paradigm. We are in the very early stages of development of the emergentist uh, um, research program. If successful and if widely adopted, such theories of emergent organization in general biology may in time become a new paradigm. ID seems to me to provide only a negative cap capability by criticizing proposed naturalistic and emergencist explanations for the origin of life. Good critics are always helpful in the process of scientific research, but any research program worth its salt also has to guide in the generation of new experiments and theories. Uh, note four, we will discuss because it's very important. Um, through processes of emergence, life itself may be viewed as begotten, not made, from underlying natural laws in a dialectic of self-organization and selection. Dialectic, I think that's originated with um, Hegel. Um, I'm a little confused as to what it's doing in science, but to be fair, this is note four, or, or part of note four, to be fair to ID advocates, however, a more substantial ID research program seems to be brewing as of late, as evidenced in the research lab being done through the Evolutionary Informatics Lab and the work of the Biologic Institute, um, references uh, on the web, of course, and its journal Biocomplexity. Indeed, this present volume is part of that general trend. So, yeah, w uh, intelligent design is actually starting to do research work, according to the note. The only thing that can be said is that we must wait and see whether these efforts will go anywhere. 
Very charitable, actually. What might we expect of any theory of general biology about the origin of life? We not only have to acknowledge the difficulty of the problem of how life might have emerged here on Earth, but we need to accept that we should not expect a single narrative trajectory for not life's emergence. Thus, we can only hope to elucidate plausible pathways of emergence tested by simulation experiment and what geological data is available. This is not unlike the point Keith Miller makes about the paleontological record, in which we do not have all the details, but do have some general patterns to explain. If there, uh, I love the ending here. Of course, you'll recognize the, uh, the homage to the origin of species. If there is not grandeur in this life, in this view of the emergence of life, at least there is a reasonable hope for project, uh, progress through applications of the tools of complex systems dynamics towards the development of a theory of emergence and of general biology. And that's a quick and dirty pass through uh, the section. My, my own opinion is that um, Gordon's, Kaufman's, and Weber's attitude is much better than the standard attitude. They disagree with intelligent design, but they're still willing to dialogue with it. And I think that that is important and helpful. The one problem with Kaufman's life bubbling up is that life doesn't bubble up experimentally. Omnis cellula et cellula, every cell from a cell. Uh, either life is easy to form, in which case this should be demonstrated and has not been, or life is hard to form, just hard enough to be likely to have happened in the universe, but not likely to be, have happened in the laboratory, which is kind of an untestable way of doing things. Or life is virtually impossible to form, which of course is the opinion of Eugene Koonin, whom we saw a few weeks ago, which leaves God or an essentially infinite number of universes as your only two choices. I also have a major problem with Kaufman's denial that probability calculations can be made. I, I think that he's probably right that um, exact calculations cannot be made. But certainly approximations, even optimistic calculations, can be made. Kunin's toy calculations are one of those. And I think that even if you do the toy calculations, giving them every benefit of the doubt, it indicates that the chance is far too unlikely to be a reasonable ex explanation for the origin of life until you pull in the universe or God, something to help it. The problem that I have with uh, Weber is that he, he ignores the evidence, or at least some of the evidence that I know about, or glosses over it, and particularly he ignores the intelligent design comments that he criticizes. Protein formation is not nearly as easy as he implies. Um, just ask Axe or Gager, and they have papers to back that up which, of course, means laboratory research behind those papers. I, I am, however, grateful that these two people put their proposals down alongside of those of intelligent design. Uh, the contrast is striking. Darwin fanatics tried to destroy the book, or to be more precise, to, to prevent it from ever being published. These people actually put their papers in the book. The contrast is striking. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Uh, Is that dead? Oh, it's, it's, it's off. Try it again. Um, Perhaps I couldn't follow it fast enough, but it seemed like an awful elaborate way to dance around the fact that you either have God or you have multiple universes. We got no clue. Nothing works, and we got to just say it. It, because it's here, it emerged on its own, and we now then must pursue this emergent theory in order to say it just happened. And it seems awful unscientific discussion on, to me. It leaves me wondering, 
we seem really circular and we seem, well, it happened, therefore it must be. And we have this emergent philosophy here and so, because something self-organized like crystals or whatever, then obviously that must be it. The universe just took care of or this just took care of itself and because it needed to be here, it did. Did I miss that? I mean, I think that that's not a completely unfair way of, of looking at how they're, how they're looking at things. Life is here. It obviously couldn't have happened by standard. Uh, so there must be some extra law that kind of makes it happen. Uh, not usually, no. I uh, think this is very interesting. Uh, uh, I do appreciate the fact that Kaufman uh, was cautious about how much we don't know. Uh, this is a, you know, this, this is a basic problem we all face. We don't know how much we don't know because we just don't know how much there is out there. Uh, I'm a little concerned about the fact that after he had appealed to not knowing, he felt quite free to talk about the bubble, uh, which involves a tremendous amount of ignorance. And he's not being consistent here uh, to apply uh, ignor ignorance to statistical tests. But when it comes to his view, he doesn't apply that same principle, at least not as rigorously. Uh, he, so uh, how seriously should we take him uh, in view of his inconsistency here? Uh, and you could say the same thing a little bit about uh, emergence, uh, although uh, he doesn't appeal to ignorance as much as uh, Kaufman does, uh, whoever doesn't. So, uh, <clears throat> but when you look at this whole picture here, uh, are these folks uh, beginning to declare almost that the universe is not rational? Uh, they seem to be leaving the, the traditional scientific uh, uh, view that, hey, we can test this, we gotta test this, and so on. Uh, uh, when they uh, just arbitrarily appeal to, to uh, bubbles, and, uh, hey, it just came forth, or emergence, hey, it, obviously it happened, and so on. Uh, they seem to be departing from uh, rigor. Now, uh, they can say the same thing to, to uh, hey, uh, uh, where did God come from? You know, the traditional question, where did God come from, and so on. Uh, we may not know where God came from, but uh, we do know that uh, we can test whether or not it seems like there is a God, even though we may not know where it comes from. So uh, you need to keep that particular uh, uh, factor in mind as we look at this. Uh, but it seems to me that uh, uh, this uh, presentation, in a way, is, uh, uh, tends to... Uh, degrade the respect one has for science and that here are these scientists and uh, I, I don't know how it depends on how you can call them scientists uh, they're moving entirely into the arbitrary speculative uh, and I'd say almost arbitrary conclusion before they uh, as they try to come to this uh, we need to be as creationists we need to be uh, also rigorous with the data <clears throat> and the, as when we're rigorous with the data, the case is, is more in favor of creation than it is in favor of evolution. And do all this. So, uh, I, so I, get, I get several messages here. One, that this is too much speculation. I, I just can't. I mean, but I, I'm impressed with the fact how uh, these folks tried to solve the problem and how little data they had to do it to, to support their view. Uh, this, I mean, this strengthens the, uh, the creation viewpoint. But well, I, I think that, uh, you know, one of the things that this is doing is it's just telling us, you know, if this <coughs> is their best shot, then they <coughs> haven't got much. No, they, exactly, this is it. 
I do appreciate that they're warning about, you know, hey, uh, there is an ignorance you have here and so on. But, but when I get to look at my hard science, I'm talking about, you know, uh, probabilities of, uh, you may not call that hard science, or life originating, all those, you know, those problems and so on. Uh, I still I face with the fact that uh, the hard science tells me there's got to be a God here. There's got to, that you can't get this, you can't just you get a scream emergence or a, a bubble and uh, go on and forget about the problem. It's there. Uh, and the data, the hard data is in favor of some kind of design here. You just can't put that together otherwise. I think it is the desperation of main, keeping the divine foot out of the door is going to destroy the credibility of science in our population because they cannot keep hanging on to things that continued research keeps implying higher and higher levels of complexity. Any person on the street will assume that a complex mechanism that they see is designed by some intelligence they saw somewhere, whether it's so simple as the watch and the computer and all the gazillion examples we have. They have lots of examples of the fact that complexity and design intelligence did that. They have no examples of emergence or randomness causing the, a complex or a designed feature. So they've got all this evidence staring them in the face that design comes from intelligence. And the desperation of, quotes, biological sciences to avoid that obvious fact, I believe is degradating the faith in the scientific community to some degree. When they start going to a discussion like we just read, it's, it begins to sound like an awful lot of effort to throw confusion over the thing, although I admire the fact that at least they admit that we got, that Darwinism is dying and that we got to come up with something. But it, if, if intelligent design or creationists took that approach to things, it would really destroy our credibility. So it, it seems to me they are absolutely desperate, and I'm afraid the fallout is going to be a societal lack of trust in the scientific community and work that's done in the future. They're, what the science guy claimed we were going to, by teaching an alternate point of view, we we're going to ruin science in America with the students in our schools, I believe they are doing by denying the discussion and free effort to look at all possibilities. Yeah, and, and the point of it is uh, truth can truth can manage to stand on its own two feet. It doesn't need those kinds of, of, uh, of artificial supports. And they are artificial. There's no two ways about it. That this is one thing that's right down my line because I'm an emergentologist, so I can discuss emergence. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they certainly would want, not want us to practice medicine with this approach to science. No, they would not want us to practice medicine that way. And uh, it, is, it is just simply amazing to, to watch the twists and turns to try to avoid mm -hmm. the obvious mm -hmm. conclusion. And sometimes the ignoring, you know, you say, oh, they're doing all this wonderful research, but you mm -hmm. don't actually integrate the research that they're doing, you know as to, for example, how probable it is that a protein will actually fold up the way it needs to to create, uh, you know, the, the statistics are, I think, like 1 in 10 to the 73rd proteins or, or amino acid chains will actually fold into the proper protein rather than 25%. Well, you know, now you're starting to talk some very, very small numbers. Um, and the thing about the thing about the claim that, well, we don't know that in the case of proteins, we do know the space because there are 20 amino acids. They can only be joined in um, 20 to the 
say, 35th mm -hmm. power um, ways in order to get a string that's 35 <laughs> amino acids long, a, a peptide. There isn't any question as to what the space is. You know, it is mathematically fixed. It is not even, uh, not even, you know, kind of physically fixed. That's a, the the concept. There is, uh, is basically unbendable. And to try to say that, well, we don't know what the probabilities are, and therefore, well, the, your arguments are suspect. Well, not for that kind of stuff. They're not. And I was er very interested to note that the guy, uh, I think it was Weber, was saying that. It's really hard to explain uh, the DNA code. And that, again, is a code that has a specific number of, uh, of uh, uh, residues for a DNA or you know, to produce RNA that produces a specific protein. And those numbers are known, and they're hard, and there's no way of changing them. So how one can go, well, mm -hmm. we don't know what the probabilities are. Well, we can start calculating them, and uh, we can start testing them, and the tests are not going well. So I, I, I'm glad they're doing this. I'm glad they're staying with the program. It is much better than, than shooting arrows and trying to ban books and, and uh, trying to get people off of uh, faculty and you know, that kind of thing, which has been going on by, by much of the standard um, scientific community. Um, not all. And sometimes people like Behe luck out and they're tenured and so you can't fire them anyway. <laughs> um, but there are a lot of people who would like to fire him, and in fact, on his website, he has to put a <laughs> disclaimer that Lehigh University does not support his work. If they could fire him, they would. All for suggesting that maybe there was an intelligence that monkeyed with the uh, with nature in order to get what we now see in life. <coughs> Um, it, it's, it's truly amazing. Um, I, I'm glad to see some people that are at least halfway rational and say, you know what, you can't overcome this by force. You have to overcome it by persuasive arguments, even though, at least in my opinion, they don't have much of a persuasive argument. It keeps things at least civil. Mm -hmm. I think the question um, that's been raised about uh, what's happening here in science is uh, a vital one. And I think we can raise the question, is science advancing or is it degenerating now? In terms of acquiring new information, it is definitely advancing. But in terms of uh, rigor and quality, I think, I think there, there seems to be uh, a de some suggestion of degeneration. We, we uh, you know, Lakatos, uh, Lakatos, sometimes uh, you pronounce it that way. Anyway, I don't know which way it goes. Uh, he made this interesting comment once that, you know, in the old days, uh, we used to have waste paper baskets that uh, were when you wrote a manuscript and uh, you didn't feel it was very good, or your friends looked at it and didn't feel it was correct and so on, you could put your manuscript in waste paper baskets. He says, now we've got, he says, we've got scientific journals to take the place of waste paper baskets. You, just, you don't even read your manuscript, you just send it out. Uh, which, which raises the other comment, uh, if you can't get a scientific journal to publish your journal, you just start a new journal. They're starting new scientific journals like crazy on the internet, you know. It's, uh, so I, I think there's a serious uh, problem here that uh, of quality degeneration that we need to keep in mind here, yeah. as uh, rigor seems to be departing from 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 scientific uh, 
at least in certain geological areas, I mean, it, this is hard time. One has difficulty telling the difference between witchcraft and geology in some, some of these topics. Well, next week, we're going to actually discuss a, a, a case where a scientific paper was absolutely unequivocally proven wrong, and they won't either correct or add an uh, addendum to the article. And it happens to be in a field that is politically charged, and probably there's part of the reason for it is there. So your comment will be expanded upon next week. Come back for more.